Jumana and I met on the green grass of America. It was a family potluck. She was holding her baby boy, I was holding mine. She had the kind of dark beauty that I recognized from home, so I walked up to her. What's his name? Tamar. And yours? Itai. Where are you from? Jerusalem. Uh, near Ramallah, actually. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm from Jerusalem, too. Her American husband stepped right in. My wife is a Palestinian, you know. As if I didn't know. But I didn't know if she'd want to talk to me. You see, I grew up in Jerusalem, a proud Israeli Jew. When my grandmother would hear the word Arab, she'd say, Puh! Yimach shmam! May their name be erased. Her son, my uncle, was killed in the 1948 war for our independence. I come from a place where the news is on the radio every hour, and on the buses, the drivers turn the volume up and all conversations stop. There's always something. Bombs in the marketplace, buses blowing up, wars. But Jumana and I watched our children grow up together on that green grass without the fear. No one put it in words, but each of us knew. Back home, my son would grow up to go to the army and check IDs at roadblocks. Her son would grow up to arrive at the checkpoint and throw stones at the oppressor. Over the years, Jumana and I did start to talk, but it was mostly mom stuff until one day. As a storyteller, I was creating a story from my memories of third grade in the 1967 war, when I realized I've known this woman now for seven years. We both grew up in the same city, not even five miles apart, and I never heard what that war was like for her. Did she sleep with all the neighbors in the furnace room like I did? Did Palestinians even have a bomb shelter? So I called her and she said, the only memory I have from my childhood is fear. I grew up under occupation. I never met an Israeli who wasn't a soldier or a settler until I met you. She said, I don't have a story to tell. Look, I'm not a typical case. Our house wasn't demolished, our trees were not uprooted, and listen, my people are being killed every single day, and my life is sheltered, I'm here. I'm not a typical case, why would you want to hear my story? I said, I never had a friend who was a Palestinian before. I just want to know how it is. So she said, all right, I don't have a story, but I'll answer questions. And so I asked questions about her school and her home and her family and the neighborhood, and the stories came pouring out. And for the first time in my life, I heard what it actually feels like to be a Palestinian growing up under Israeli occupation. She told me that when she was 10, she saw a 14-year-old boy being beaten by soldiers, and that was the first time in her life she understood the meaning of the word hate. Hearing this felt like someone just kicked me in the gut, because those soldiers that terrified and haunted her entire childhood were our symbol of security, our heroes, everyone that I knew that turned 18 and went to the army, including my brother, my people were the them. It was painful. But I kept listening because she was telling me her story. And eventually, we began to talk about history. And I said something that was the truth, a historical fact, and she said, that's not true. That's Zionist propaganda. <clears throat> And then she said something that was the truth, a historical fact. And I said, that's not the way it was. That's Arab propaganda. We found ourselves arguing. Then she said, look at us. We're becoming defensive. We laughed. I picked up the baby so she could make a soft-boiled egg for the other kids. And we continued to talk. And this experience 
our ability to continue to talk and hold on to our compassion in spite of differences, it was so powerful. It propelled me to create a live performance called A Land Twice Promised, where I tell our personal stories and the stories of our mothers that echo those contradicting national narratives of our people. And soon after I began touring this show, I realized that what I learned from this process could be useful for others. And that my story is not just about two mothers meeting on the playground. It's not even about Israelis and Palestinians. It's about the power of storytelling and the power of listening to the story of the other, even and especially when they're different and their story difficult. So I became interested in using storytelling as a peace-building tool, with a definition of peace expanded to include issues of diversity and bridging differences in our workplace and communities. So what is it about storytelling that makes it useful to connect across differences? We know that diverse voices and diverse abilities, be it in the workplace or community, contribute to greater performance and greater resilience. But we all know that it is not easy to work or get along with those who are different, who do not share our preferences and values. It's difficult because our brain is wired. Our brain is wired to keep us safe. We have a biological inclination to seek belonging and bond with those who are most familiar. The way a person looks, speaks, and even smells unconsciously alerts us to whether or not they are from our tribe and therefore safe. And the more different someone seems, the less real they become, and the easier it is to label them and shut them out. And because our brain is wired to keep us safe, we are also attached to our cognitive constructs of the world, our opinions, our worldview. It's part of how we navigate life. It's part of our identity. So when my way of looking at things is challenged by someone else's, it can feel threatening. We either argue or we shut down and don't engage. But imagine if we could look at our differences not as a threat, but as an opportunity. What if we could bring people to listen not to concepts and opinions, but to experience? You see, story is based in experience. And when we open up to the experience, the story of another human, things begin to shift. The first thing that shifts is the emotional connection. In a very short time, there's a sense of trust and intimacy. Now, we're not talking becoming best friends forever, but intimacy in the sense that you, you know more about the person than the sum of the words exchanged between you. I remember an interfaith workshop or a Jewish woman was partnered with a Muslim man. And I watched at first her arms were like armor and her face a harsh resolve. And as she listened, her arms came down, her face softened, and then she turned to us and she said, I can't believe that was a three-minute story. I feel like I know this person, and it's the first time in my life I sat and talked face to face with an Islamic person. It changed my life. So this sense of intimacy and trust is created not just by the content of the story, but the process of being together in the same space and time sharing stories. And this, this process is the core attribute that sets storytelling apart. Because you see, it's not just about the story. It's about us. That human connection that happens when we are in the same space, face to face, listening and being listened to, is what creates transformation. The second thing that happens when we open up to the experience of another human is a shift in the cognitive connection. When we argue, we present our opinions. And we naturally become defensive because accepting your point of view means I have to change or invalidate mine. But when we listen to a story, 
we use the imagination. I get to temporarily suspend disbelief and look at the world in a way that is not mine. There's no need to become defensive because imagining or understanding your point of view doesn't mean I have to adopt it or invalidate my own. There was a time in another workshop that I was very nervous that a participant was going to get up and walk away. She was a deeply religious woman with fundamental views, and her partner was sharing a story about getting an abortion. But she didn't walk away. And at the end, this is what she said. That was the first time in my life I was able to consider something that completely contradicted everything I believe in because she was telling me her story. I found myself being able to accept that an abortion could be a valid option, even essential for someone else. So listening to a story allows us to suspend judgment and open up to different points of view. But it's not just the listening that creates transformation. A fascinating scientific study in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology shows that self-affirmation reduces ideological close-mindedness. Apparently, we do our best when our self-integrity, our need to see ourselves as good, is affirmed. When individuals first recall the personal strength or a treasured memory, large differences and rigid ideological views were transcended. The study shows that sharing a story prompted respect and openness to information that otherwise wouldn't be considered. My Palestinian friend shared the story of finding courage in fifth grade, running through the alleys of the old city to get her little sister to safety during a demonstration. I shared the story of my mother, and the pride of my family in the uncle who sacrificed his life for our independence. Because we shared these memories, we affirmed our sense of self-integrity, and it became possible to hear the historical narrative of the other. So arguing contributes to fortifying opinions and polarizing points of view. But storytelling, offers a space for sharing self-affirming treasured memories that reduce inflexibility and ideological close-mindedness. Now, in my work, I've been inspired by the great religion scholar Karen Armstrong to take this emotional and cognitive shift another step. Armstrong talks about the centrality of compassion to all the world's religions. Compassion, she says, doesn't mean pity, feeling sorry for another. Compassion means putting yourself in the position of another person, learning about their pain. So I made a choice, not just to listen to my friend's stories, but to publicly tell her stories and the stories of our mothers from their points of view. For that, I had to put myself in the position of the other, tell the story as if it was me who felt that hate for Israeli soldiers, as if it was me who lay on top of three babies during a night of nonstop bombing like her mother in 1967, as if it was me who lost a beloved brother like my mother in 1948. And telling the stories in this way gave me a deeper experience of compassion. So in my workshops, participants learn not just to listen to the story of the, of the other, but to tell the story of another person from that person's point of view. Using storytelling as a peace-building tool is not about changing opinions. It's about changing our response to differences and learning how to accept multiple points of view simultaneously and live with paradox. Because you see, living with complexity and understanding or accepting the paradoxes around us is the hardest thing for all of us. We all want answers. We want clear views. We all need validation. But as long as I insist 
on one answer? On only my story reflected in everything, I'm not open to change. The key to the future is understanding that reality is so complex that accepting paradox can have positive value. When we make room for paradox, we make room for change. Jumana and I listened to each other's stories. It allowed us to expand our mind and make room for paradox so we could hold a perception that was different and even threatening to our own. It led us to insight and compassion. But I don't pretend that it's easy. Many times, when I listened to her, and her version of truth was so different, the temptation was huge to just label her, oh, those Palestinians, and walk away. And I had to make a choice. Do I stay safe in my familiar shelter of us versus them? Or do I stay present to this human story and allow myself the uneasy territory of paradox? The choice to let go of our fears and trust stories is ours. And I'd like to invite you to make that choice. It isn't an easy one, but choose to listen and to tell. Seek out the other. Cultivate an attitude of curiosity and open heart and use storytelling to create bridges in our polarized communities and workplaces. I invite you to choose to become ambassadors of peace. Thank you.